Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Sharon, uh, president of the DC League. There's lots of familiar names showing um, and lots of new faces and phone numbers as well. So this is really nice. Um, we do hope you and yours are managing all right in these very strange and difficult times. Um, we've recently celebrated both Passover and Easter, and both of those holidays involve hard boiled eggs. The hotter the water, the tougher they get. And that's just like us leaguers. Um, we're not letting this virus get in the way of doing our work. Um, we're just not going to let that happen. So we're hosting this webinar to give visibility and voice to the challenges we face as US citizens living in our nation's capital. So Jess will talk a little bit about how we're going to work this and um, introduce uh, the next segment. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Bennett. I am uh, one of the vice presidents of the DC League of Women Voters. Um, and just a few notes on process and how we're going to run this. We aren't using the technical webinar platform, so we do ask that folks try to keep themselves muted when possible, just so that people can hear who is speaking. Um, on a broader point, we will be recording today's webinar um, and uh, then sharing this widely with folks who weren't able to attend today. So if you prefer your voice or face not be on a recording, um, please make those adjustments to your own settings as you can. Um, in terms of questions, we're going to ask that you use the chat box to, um, to submit questions for the panelists. And that way we make sure we get all the questions, we can kind of match them to the flow of conversation and really just ensure that um, we can hear you, you can hear us, that we're able to kind of repeat them aloud for any folks who joined by phone. Um, a few other notes on how Zoom works. So um, there are two ways you can view the presentation. You can view with speaker view, which basically means whoever's talking is really big and other faces are very small. Or you can look, uh, watch in gallery view, and both of these settings are just in the top right corner of your screen. Gallery view is that Brady Bunch style of, of faces or names kind of set up. So that preference is up to you, um, and we just wanted to kind of remind you of, of that. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties during the meeting, please feel free to just put it in the chat box and I will try to manage that as best I can. Um, and I think that's all for my portion for right now. So I'm our cruise director and I'm gonna turn it back over to Kathy. Great, thanks. If, if you'd like in the chat box, tell us where you're from. I, I know there are several Washingtonians um, here, but there are names I know that are in other places. So it'd be fun for us to know where you're all uh, tuning in from or whatever the right, zooming in from. Um, I'm sure you know these basic facts about Congress, but I just want to review. Um, each state, you know, has two senators and each congressional district represents an average of 700,000 people. When bills come before the Senate, there are two people standing up and speaking for you. Even if their motivation is merely to get reelected, their obligation is to vote in your best interest. Same for your representative in the House. Someone is there looking out for you and casting a vote so that you have a voice in Congress. We do have a congressperson, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who does indeed speak up for the District of Columbia when it comes to voting. Uh-uh, different story. 
She can vote in committee, but not on the floor of the House. So we are rendered mute. We have no voting senators at all. Again, we are rendered mute. We're 712,000 residents. So if we were a state, we'd be 49th in population, ahead of Wyoming and Vermont, and we're closing in on Alaska and North Dakota. We serve in the military just like everyone else. And normally, tonight, we'd all be finishing up our tax returns, trying to get them into the mail first thing tomorrow morning. So it's good timing for me to tell you that residents of Washington, D.C. pay more federal tax than others do in 22 states. Senate Republicans and the White House deliberately chose to treat the district as a territory in the third coronavirus response bill even though the district is almost always treated as a state for federal funding because the district, unlike the territories, pays federal taxes as do the states. We had no one to speak up for us on the floor of the Senate. 50 states are guaranteed to get 1.25 billion in discretionary funding, no matter their size. But at this point, DC will get only about $750 million. So to paraphrase Shakespeare, hath not a DC resident fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means as every other US resident is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? So we're calling on Congress to give DC fair funding in their next coronavirus relief package because lives are depending on it. We cannot allow Congress to treat DC like a bargaining chip again in the next relief bill. Lives are at stake and fair funding gives DC a fighting chance to save. Hence our wanting to review with you a bit of our history and most importantly, what we all can do to remedy this situation. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to Ann Anderson. She's our league's full rights team leader and tirelessly, champions our quest for statehood. So take it away, Anna. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna read a few things because I decided I better write it down or else I'd be rattling on forever. Um, but I just wanted you to know that as we've been traveling over uh, to more than 30 states um, over the last four years, uh, a lot of people have asked how often, how this situation came to be. Um, so let me just give you a quick thumbnail sketch. So it starts in 1801 and Congress moved into DC and officially became our nation's capital. So at that moment, people living in DC became disenfranchised. And even back then there were congressmen who worried about making DC residents citizens, subjects instead of citizens. There weren't many people in DC back then and they basically Congress kicked the can down the road. Um, so and then there was lots of rhetoric about democracy and local control and lots of tries at different forms of government over the last two centuries. But let me just jump forward to the last 50 years and when citizens, DC citizens finally got to vote for, for president in 1964, that was the first time since 1801, and got to elect local officials and our non-voting delegate to Congress under our limited Home Rule Act in the early 70s. So that's not very long ago that we got to do this. Now, just to be clear, we call it limited Home Rule because in fact, Congress still maintains full control over all our laws and budget, and in fact, could disband the Home Rule Act anytime. We govern at the local level subject to the wishes of Congress. So this recent blow to our well-being is only a part of a continuing pattern of using DC as a way to make political points. This is also not the first time that Congress has acted in ways that threaten the well being and health of people who live in DC. Um, you know, there are a lot of little nitty gritty things here and there, but 
this is actually, you know, making it very difficult, much more difficult for us to take care of our people. Uh, for instance, um, until 2007, for a number of years, DC was prevented by Congress from using DC tax money to fund a needle exchange program. Uh, just for the record, a needle exchange program is a proven way to reduce transmission of HIV AIDS and other bloodborne diseases. So our HIV AIDS infection rate was among the highest in the country. But then starting in 2008, the restriction was removed and lo and behold, DC's infection rate went down substantially that year and following years. So while it remains to be seen how this lack of full funding as if we were a state, because um, that's how we are normally treated, uh, will affect our capacity to care for all of our DC residents. Having Congress threaten the health of people in DC is not a new phenomenon. It's these kinds of egregious acts that highlight our need for statehood, since if we were a state, we would have two senators, as Kathy noted, who'd be representing us and fighting for our well being in these perilous times. So we're gonna talk more about how these things work, but I would like to bring another voice into our conversation now. Uh, Josh Birch is one of the founders of Neighbors United for DC Statehood and has been working on talking, hard talking to senators about the need for statehood for the residential and commercial parts of DC. So he's got kids to get to bed, so he can't be with us long. So welcome Josh and please, uh, come up, weigh in. Thanks, Dan, and, and thank everybody for joining us on a, a Tuesday night. <clears throat> they all, all the days sort of blend together, so I actually had to think about that. Um, and uh, I also want to point out that I'm a longtime League of Women Voters member, too. So, um, long time uh, runs in my family. So. I'm really happy to be here. And as Ann mentioned, my group is a, it started out of our Neighborhood Civic Association in Northeast DC, the Brooklyn Neighborhood Civic Association. And it sort of grew across the city um, sort of organically of more DC residents wanting to uh, be involved in the statehood fight to, to do something um, to help push the cause forward. And we partnered with the League of Women Voters, we partnered with groups like DC Vote um, to travel around the country and talk with people about why we want to be a state. But the one thing that we really need is people in the states to talk to your senators and members of Congress. When we started our work advocating on the Hill in 2014, there wasn't even a, or on the Senate side, or in 2009, sorry, we were advocating for, for statehood. But in 2011, when we really started our work, there was one co-sponsor on the DC statehood bill in the House. And there were zero, there wasn't even a Senate bill for statehood in 2011. And so we were knocking on doors, talking with representatives, and then we started talking with senators as well. And in late 2012, Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut introduced the statehood bill on December 4th, right before he retired. Um, so that was the first time in 18 years that there was a statehood bill in the United States Senate. And so that was at the very end of 2012. There were three sponsors on that bill, so four senators total on the statehood bill in the Senate in 2012. Through our work, the work of a lot of other groups in DC and through, and through the work of people in the state um, on the DC statehood bill in the US Senate. And that's really important, um, but it's not enough. And uh, my video stopped, but provided you all can still hear me, I'll just keep yapping. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is increase the number of co-sponsors on the bill because we wanna make sure that Senate leadership, when the right time comes, Senate leadership is able to pass the statehood bill. Um, so we can't stop at 36, we need to get to 51, if we can get to 60 even senators. And I'm not gonna name names, but I saw that there were people from Arizona, Michigan, and Nevada on this webinar. And some of your senators need to step up and support DC statehood openly. 
They also are senators that didn't sign on to a letter saying DC deserved equal funding in the coronavirus relief bill. So those are some key states where we really could have, if we had some good citizens calling their senators, contacting them, not only could we get equal funding for the district in the short term in terms of corona relief, but we also could work to get them as co-sponsors to the DC statehood bill. So in a couple of years, maybe after the next election, we're gonna be ready to actually pass the statehood bill in the Senate because the statehood bill will pass the House this year because of the great work of the legal and voters, civil rights and voting rights activists across the country, groups like DC Vote here in the district, the statehood bill in the House has over 220 co-sponsors, which means it has enough co-sponsors to pass the bill on the House floor. I'll stop because I've been talking for a long time. Um, and Ann or, or Kathy, I don't know if you guys want to take it away. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick it back up again. Um, Jess, I think this would be a good time for us to just check in and see if people have comments or questions um, that have floated up. So, so Evelyn Maddox has asked, are Senators Blunt and Holly of Missouri supportive of DC statehood? No, um, neither Senator um, in Senator Blunt, we've been trying to contact him for a lot longer. Senator Holly's obviously new. Neither Senator's office will even respond to meeting requests on the bill. So that's a no. Uh, Mary Pelton Cooper asks, how did Michigan senators vote? Well, they voted for the relief bill, but they didn't, neither one of the senators, neither Senator Stabenow or Senator Peters signed the Senate letter saying DC deserves equal funding. And neither senator will commit to co-sponsoring the DC statehood bill. Um, Senator Stabenow's office for the last six years has repeatedly told me we need to hear from more Michiganders about this, why is this important to them? We need to hear from our constituents. And so I've asked, I said, well, what does that mean? You need to hear from 30 people from Michigan, 300 or 30,000. And they won't say, they just say, well, we need to hear from more people. Senator Peters has repeatedly said, his office has said that their boss will not sponsor the state's bill at this time. So it doesn't really say, he doesn't say he's against it, but at this time doesn't really give us much to work with. Um, let's and see, yes, we have both New Jersey senators are supportive of statehood. They have been for a long time. I saw that and Senator Booker is a native Washingtonian born in the District of Columbia. And he is one of the few senators that openly talks about DC statehood on the Senate floor as part of his speeches. Um, so we have another question here, which is, what is the basis for opposition in the Senate to statehood? And that's from Debbie Wallace. You want to take that, Josh? Like, what have you heard from people? So most of the people that oppose D.C. statehood don't say it out loud. Um, you know, fr from our perspective, most of the officers that don't support statehood, they actually won't meet with us in general. We have had some um, meetings where we have gotten into healthy debates about it. Um, Senator Rand Paul, for one, his office says it's unconstitutional, that there should be a federal district, and by having D.C. as a state, there wouldn't be a federal district. The problem is, is they didn't read the bill, because the bill shrinks the federal district from what it is now, which is roughly 68 square miles, to being you know, less than five square miles, which is the mall, the White House, it would be a small federal core. So we would keep a federal district as the constitution requires, um, not exceeding 100 miles square, which is a constitutional requirement because we're shrinking the size, not increasing it. And then it would admit the residential commercial portions of the district as a 51st state. So the statehood bill gets around the constitutional question but a lot of people just sort of fall back and say, well, the founders wanted a federal district, and we keep that through the state of the bill. There is a huge partisan edge to the opposition to statehood. Um, two decades ago, when Ted Kennedy was leading the statehood fight um, in the Senate, he always said it was the four twos. The district was too black, too poor, too urban, and too democratic. 
and those were the, the, the four twos of why people don't support DC statehood. And it's about race, it's about politics, it's about the urban and rural divide. And right now the partisan makeup of our country, there is an urban and rural divide based on party lines as well. And the District of Columbia is overwhelmingly big D democratic in terms of how we vote, but we're, we are also un, overwhelmingly undemocratic in how we are treated, small d. So, so there, is, there is opposition. Mitch McConnell earlier this year called DC statehood full bore socialism, which quite frankly, I don't even understand what he's talking about when he says that, but you know, that's Mitch McConnell. Um, so there is a lot of it right now is about pure partisan politics. And then some of the underlying stuff is, is racial politics and um, r racism in America. Okay, thank you, Josh. So do we have any other questions at this point? Uh, Margaret DeLacy, who I believe is was born in the district, is that right? Did I, am I connecting those two? Oh no, sorry, that was somebody else, sorry. I was trying to connect comments. Uh, she lived here for six years, uh, has said, I've always supported DC statehood for half a century and I've wondered why DC was so restrained. I keep waiting for a general strike, especially the bartenders. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, part of, like, let me answer that and then if other people want to chime in, that'd be good. Um, my take on this is number one, that like I said, Congress could decide to take what little um, limited home rule we have away anytime. They could just decide to do that because, and they've done it before. In the, in the 1800s, late 1800s, we were a territory. And we actually had a governor. And uh, they actually got pretty scared of that and just, disbanded it all and put in the three commissioner system, which lasted for about a hundred years. So, you know, part of it is, I think, a colonial mentality, as in, we always have to keep looking over our shoulder to see what and who is going to do what to us next. So I think it's really important for us to understand that we could have a general strike, but then how do you come away from that? Or what is it that you, we want to have happen um, next? And would that really make a, enough of a splash in the Congress, which is the one that has the space and time and uh, authority to make it different? Um, and so I think it's really an issue of what are our best um, strategies and tactics so josh you want to say anything else i'm aware that we're coming up on your uh cutoff time so let me give you any more if you want to say anything else here no i'm 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 good i'm happy to answer if, uh, any more if there's any questions um okay question from san diego Go ahead, Rosemary. Okay, I don't know. I don't see my picture on here, but I don't know how to get it on. Anyway, uh, I was a charter member of the DC Statehood Party in the late 60s, uh, 1970. Julius Hobson organized it and the leadership, Josephine Butler and Hilda Mason. Maybe some of you remember that if you're old timers there. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, so I'm just astonished that 50 years later, we still are the only capital in the world that uh, does not have our own <laughs> um, suffrage. So anyway, I'm wondering if um, DC statehood is in the democratic platform every presidential race. Will it be in the platform this year, this summer? My understanding is that it is. Um, I and and just to be very clear, since 
since the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, I will also tell you that it is not in the Republican Party so that we know that those two things, of course, the statehood party, the DC statehood Green Party has it. Um, and I don't know about the Libertarians. So those are our four um, parties that have ballot status in DC. Do you know, does anybody else know that? No. About the Libertarian Party? Yeah. Uh, I believe they had the language that was close to support of them in 2016, but I can't remember exactly. The Republican Party's platform language related to the district was openly hostile towards DC, um, getting more voting rights and getting autonomy. It wasn't just like, it would have been nice if they had said nothing about us, but they went for overt being mean um, yeah. in their 2016. Yeah, yeah. And, and Rosemary, I do remember all of those people. Yes, I was here. I've been here since 1964. So yes, thank you. So we have um, a few questions, I think. Uh, one, I think the question from Joyce about votes, I think we're gonna get to. So Anne's gonna run us through some commonly asked questions and then maybe we'll save the rest of the questions we currently have. We're gonna making sure we get through those most frequent questions. And then some of the strategy questions, I think it's helpful for uh, to hear from you all and, and get ideas of strategies. I don't know that we could speak to the legality or uh, influence of any, all, any and all of those. Uh, that's not necessarily our bailiwick, but I think it's helpful for us to hear your ideas in the chat or in the, in the group about what you think we could do to raise the profile of our issues. Yep. And so Josh, let, let, let us let you off the hook and say hi to Karina and uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great night. All right. Take care. <clears throat> so um, let me, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on exactly how statehood would work because um, a lot of people don't understand that. And Josh did a good job of describing how, in fact, it would be uh, reduced, um, that, that the federal district would be reduced. Um, Jess, do you have a, a picture of that map? Maybe we could just put it up briefly so that people, because I don't want to disappear anybody, but, um, you know, it's, we're still going to have a federal district. Um, and so people should not be worried. We are actually still going to have a, a, a nation's capital that will look like our nation's capital. It just won't include my backyard, which would be really nice. Um, and so um, one of, that's one of the things that really people get really worried about. But those of us who live in the current district then would We'd, we'd live in a state where we'd get to decide how big our fire stations are and where we want to locate dog parks, um, that how much we want to spend on our education and other such local issues, all of which have on occasion taken up time on the floor of Congress. So do you see how right there in the middle, that's where, that's the part that would be the federal district. Um, and all the West around where 700,000 plus of us live would be the new state. So <clears throat> there's another suggestion that I you know, wanna uh, be very clear about. Um, and that is maybe we should go back to Maryland. A lot of people ask about that. Well, no state of the union can have its boundaries changed without their consent. So Maryland would have to want us and most of Maryland's congressional delegation is firmly behind uh, statehood for DC. And furthermore, by the way, DC citizens have voted 
if voting counts at all in this democracy, we've have overwhelmingly voted to petition for statehood. So retrocession, which is what going back to Maryland is called, is not actually a viable option. Then there's another question people often think, well, but DC is funded by the federal government. Um, and so how would we support ourselves if we, were, if we became a state? Well, it's not true. Um, our local budget is actually funded by tax dollars locally raised with only a small percentage coming from federal funds. In fact, eight states have the same or a greater percentage of federal money making up their annual budget. So we're at about 25%, at least the last one I looked at, the last set of figures I looked at, which was several years ago. So I'm not saying that it's this year. I don't know exactly what this year is. But for instance, Mississippi uh, at, in that same chart um, was the highest percentage and they were at 40, 40%, 40%. 40.9%, I think. So at 25, we are right on par with uh, several other states. Um, and, um, you know, we, the, how do we get federal funds? Well, it's mostly through block grants, like for Medicaid or transportation, those kinds of things that the federal government dispenses to all the states and the District of Columbia. Um, so, <clears throat> and I just, just to be interested to say one more thing about um, funding, um, but not to get down in the weeds too much. If, when we become a state, we'll have to take back our Justice Department from the federal government, which is currently running it. And so that's a lot of money, but, when we become a state, we also get to organize ourselves so that those, of those people who work in DC would pay taxes in DC. Right now, if you live in Maryland or West Virginia or, um, or Virginia or even Delaware, some people come in from Delaware, um, when you go back home, you pay taxes in the state. We're not allowed to tax people who work here and work elsewhere, who work here and live elsewhere. So this would change. And we do things like the way that New York and New Jersey have, you know, like if you live in New Jersey, you work in New York, you live in New York, you work in New Jersey. They've got a reciprocal deal and that's how we would do it. Um, so um, right now, um, just to be clear, there is a bill in the house uh, the DC, Washington DC Admission Act. It's made it through the House Oversight and Reform Committee. First time ever. It's going to go to the House um, floor and will more than likely pass, as Josh mentioned. Um, and then there are a number of co-sponsors in the Senate bill. But as we already heard, it's, that's going to be difficult to pass. So that's part of what we need to be doing um, at this point. Um, what I would like to do now is to see if there are people who would like to say, make some other comments or questions um, so that we have more of a discussion process than me talking. So uh, the floor is open. I'm wondering whether people are interested in knowing what they could do um, because it does seem like it could be sort of over overwhelming and here we are sitting here and what do we do? Uh, so that's one of the things that we could discuss. And of course- uh, Anne, There was a question earlier in the comments that's asked, how many votes do you need to gain statehood? So just what, what needs to happen with this thing? If we yeah. were to get statehood, there are uh, 218 votes in the House, 
uh, are required. That's a simple majority. And of course, the Senate um, also could do a simple majority. Uh, that's how every other state past the first 13 uh, was admitted to the union was by simple majority vote. Um, I could well imagine that there would be people in opposition to DC statehood who would decide that they needed to try to filibuster in the Senate. Um, but it's really just a simple majority vote. So. And for the House bill, we already have enough um, co-sponsors, more than enough to pass the bill. So assuming everybody who sponsored it would also vote for it, um, we're pretty confident that HR 51, wonderful, wonderful number for that bill. <laughs> um, we're pretty confident it'll pass in the in the House. Um, yeah. Do we have and a sense of interest in the Senate, support in the Senate? We have 36 co-sponsors, including the original sponsor. Um, and um, as Josh noted, we're looking, always looking for more co-sponsors because of course, as soon as you get somebody to co-sponsor once, then you can go back to them and say, hey, you know, you were for it last time. Are you surely you're gonna be for it in the next? Because of course it all rolls over as soon as a congressional session is over, then we have to start over again. Um, so the, the actual, just to, to update here, we started off with HR 51, Kathy, but oh, right. in the oversight committee, when they had to put in the new bill that had all the yep. little details, then it changed. And you know what, right now I can't remember what the name is. You're right. <laughs> the Washington DC Admission Act, if you right. want to look it up, that's, that's what the title is. Um, and so, be what, so what can our friends who are located outside of the district do to help maybe make this more of a reality? Well, I think there's a huge amount of education that needs to happen. I mean, I cannot tell you <clears throat> how many times when I've gone else, elsewhere, and Evelyn Maddox can tell you, because I've seen her in person in their, <clears throat> um, in their own place, um, the, um, the questions are like, well, but do you really live in DC, like in DC proper? And people really don't quite understand how it could be because the picture in their heads is the mall and the Capitol. And, you know, they know I don't live on the mall. So where in the world would I live? So those kinds of things are really important for people to say, you know, there really are a lot of people who live in DC and they don't have representation in Congress and I don't like it. And, you know, letting your legislators know how you feel about it is one of the really good ways. Like Josh mentioned, um, was it Michigan? Yeah, I think it was Michigan, Mary, um, where he said, you know, they're like, we, we need to hear from Michiganders about, because do they really care? And one of the things about it is, you know, the other thing I'm asked is often, well, how, why doesn't this get changed? And one of the things that I say to people is like, well, think about it for a minute. Suppose you have a representative running for Congress, you know, a candidate, and one of their things they say is, well, I'm for DC statehood. Well, if you're living in another part of the country, and you're not really sure what, why DC has anything to do with anything, you're gonna wonder, hey buddy, why aren't you talking to me about things I'm interested in? So people in other, in the 50 states need to say, you know what, you need to fix this hole in our democracy because I don't like it. Um, and that's when, and, and if you, you know, if you can do this for us, that would be fabulous. And then candidates can start listening and can start discussing this because their constituents are interested 
in making this uh, right. So that's one of the things. Um, there's another, um, I'll see. I'm seeing, are there any graphics that are available from the league? Oh, yes. <laughs> we have a DC Statehood toolkit. Um, and um, we'll, at the end of this, we'll put up a, a piece of paper that says, that has all the information on it. Um, we'll also so that, share it with you via email so that you don't have to write down web addresses uh, on by hand because Zoom has prevented us from sharing links and chat easily because of malicious actors. So we just need to, so if you, uh, you'll, you, you will not sign you up for all of our email lists. We will send you an email with this information and you can, we'll give you a link to join our future email list if you would so choose. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Yes, there are um, there are a bunch of things on our uh, at in our DC State Toolkit. Um, we also have uh, a number of um, YouTube videos. We have a video library that we can also provide you. Let's remind me, Jess, that uh, to get that uh, for you. Um, and there are. Um, a number of other, act, like for instance, DC Vote has a lot of uh, memes that help us. We're part of the DC Statehood Coalition, so we are happy to um, to share with uh, across the board with our partners. Um, and so I'm wondering if do I see? I'm not seeing um, Barbara. Barbara is on. Barbara Helmick. Barbara, are you there somewhere? Uh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> I, I don't know why my face isn't here, but I am here in spirit and power, yes. Well, could you talk about the things that DC Vote has available that could help people uh, spread the word? Sure, well, you know, I, I do first want to say uh, to all of you uh, League of Women Voters, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member just renewed today. Um, you have so much power to influence what happens. This is a moment in history. We have never gotten this far in ending this discrimination against the people of DC. So now that you have a little bit of education about our situation, how our vote is suppressed, how uh, one of the majority of color jurisdictions is held under the thumb of Congress, you can change this. We've done really great organizing over the last four years. I mean, we have never had so much support in Congress. We have never had every single presidential candidate uh, in the Democratic Party, and as you know, we had a lot of them, um, support us. So there is a real chance that we could end this 200-year oppression of people who don't have a voice in Congress I mean, we, we, we sometimes just get so used to the situation that we, we lose track of. I mean, think about it. Congress in a pandemic just cheated us out of $750 million. And we are a hotspot with the pandemic. Congress who has people in DC who give them their fast food, who clean their offices, who work for them, that they just kicked us to the curb and said, we're not gonna give you the full amount that every other tax paying Senate, uh, uh, citizen gets across the country. So first of all, no, you have the power to move this to victory. So, uh, resources that DC Vote has. We have a action webpage. It's called show up, 
for DC and it's the number four show up number four dc.com um, it has some background information about the statehood campaign and it also has a uh, specific to this fight to get our fair share of the aid you know congress just passed this um, big aid package last week that's where they cheated us out of the 750 million um, and whether your particular legislator is on our side or not, um, it's good that they hear from you either way, that they know uh, those that are already with us, that, that they know there are voters who have their back, uh, and those that aren't with us know um, there are people who are watching what they're doing. So we, uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks, Congress is going to decide with this new aid package that they're debating right now. They're going to decide whether they will put that 750 million back in um, to help uh, DC recover, uh, just like all the other states. We're not asking for any special deal. Um, this is what all you other states got. We're just asking for our fair share. Um, so that's happening right now, um, and it'd be great to call uh, your your representatives, uh, contact your representatives, your your senators, and give DC their fair share. They're tax-paying residents, just like everybody else. Um, and it also has some things on uh, longer-term uh, campaigns. Um, but yeah, uh, the the league uh, has fabulous stuff. So uh, make use of what. Anne and Kathy have uh, put together too. Yeah, um, I just saw a question about can league can this uh, call go out to all the league members? Well, actually, the National League has been putting that out on their update um, the 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 week of the very week that this came out. They uh, had a an update that said this is not okay and um we just well dc vote just sponsored a letter that um went to congress um and many well the national league and the dc league along with how many more was it 101 yeah, that's what I thought. It looked like it was almost 100. I didn't have a chance to count. Um, different organizations, both national and local, um, were saying, hey, you know, this is not okay, and please um, rectify the situation at this next time. So it's, you know, one of the things that when you get in close, it's like there were people, there were senators who noticed that we were being treated as a territory and they went and said, hey, wait a minute, this isn't how we usually do this. And they were told, oh, yeah, we did this on purpose, you know, because D.C. is not a state. Um, and so, I mean, the mean spiritedness and the danger that they put us in is just beyond words it's beyond words and we have a few questions that we've kind of missed in the chat because we keep moving along so um joyce rudin is asking one what are the best selling points so what what can we say to people to get them on board whether that's uh probably not a necessarily representative but how do you get other other constituents in your region to kind of be convinced that this matters to them? Well, you know, part, part of what I think is, um, is the most difficult thing is, you know, like I was saying, if you have a representative, can a candidate for the representative house in, in the House of uh, Congress, um, it's hard to make that connection. So that's a really good question, uh, Joyce. The, the critical piece, I think, is, you know, that it's a hole in our democracy. You know, it's like, as in, if we don't have justice here, then there's our justice all around the country is um, 
is at risk. And part of what I've also seen happen is that a lot of people, and, and, and this is not limited to one party or the other, a lot of um, legislators have used DC as the um, petri dish for a, a uh, sort of a pet project, um, like, um, like, well, I'm thinking about um, schools, um, a number, a number of other things. I won't, I won't get down into the weeds there, but. When they use DC as a petri dish, what they're trying to see is whether those are things, the kinds of things that they would like to have happen in their part of the world. So paying attention to what's going on in DC, since we don't have any say in what happens, you can look and see, is this the kind of thing you wanna have happen in your part of the world? So it's really, a one of those things that like, might feel like two steps removed, but um, it can come back to haunt you if you don't pay attention. And wouldn't it be nice if we just eliminated this way of doing this and made us a state so that we're like all the rest of the 50 states, we'll be the 51st state, and then we don't have to worry about it that way. Um, Right. I think it's a it's a moral issue. It's a civic right, civil rights issue. It's an international human rights issue. Um, every human rights commission in the world has dinged the United States of America for the fact that our national capital does not have full representation in Congress. So, I don't know what else to say. If anybody else has any ideas about what would make sense, um, please. Well, I think one of the little things that I always, it strikes me in the league, this happens in league as well, right? I, I think we got one today, call your, uh, contact Congress today about X issue. We don't have someone to contact. So when you see something happening, so imagine, you know, as, as often as, powerless and voiceless we all might feel given kind of all the other influences on what's happening in congress right money and all the other things that the league is trying to change we don't even have the person to call and get on the rolls with right we don't even have a person to say i'm your constituent and my voice matters right so imagine if you had to call a senator from michigan every and you didn't live in michigan every time you wanted something to happen and their response was or a, a representative you're not my constituent you go in my my waste pile right my circular file of the waste bin of concerns right and that's that's what dc you know being a dc resident who cares about what's both happening here in dc and in all parts of the country, right? That's the situation we live in every day. Yeah, one of the things- We get to other questions. Kathy, yeah. sorry. I was just gonna say one of the things that Anne and I started doing when we get those kinds of things, call your senator, call your representative from other organizations that we're you know, on mailing lists, is we write back, oh, I'd love to, but who do I write to? <laughs> Um, and it's really interesting to see those responses. So they come back and say, oh, yes, our organization is supportive of D.C. statehood, blah, blah, blah. But it's just, you know, those of us who are on this call that are, are D.C. residents, we know what it feels like to get those letters. But also in terms of what you all can do, um, you can sign the petition, which is uh, on our website. Um, and we periodically deliver those. Um, we also have uh, postcards that we're happy to send you. Uh, we'll, we'll post the postcards to you. Um, they're a very clever design where um, you, there, it's two postcards uh, attached. You address um, it to your friends and they rip it apart. There it goes, Jess is showing you. And, uh, return the half to us, and then their uh, name is added to the petition. 
Uh, we did this during our um, days of action. We had about, um, well, we had 17 or 18 events during the, the uh, league centennial week. Um, and we're uh, at about a 20% 20, uh, 20 return rate, at least a 20% return rate. So um, it's been quite effective. So we're happy to do that. Just let us know. Yeah, and I still have a goodly number that I would love to send to people uh, to use. And I think it's, it's fun because then you get to say, I mean, whether you live here in DC or, or elsewhere, you get to say, hey, I'm worried about this. You know, help us out. Sign your name. And all they have to do is sign their name. And if you, if you put a postcard stamp on their return envelope or their return card, all they have to do is just rip it off, sign their name, and send it in, and we'll pick it up. It'll be great. We this is the royal week. Kathy will pick it up from the from when she goes into the office every so often. So. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us focused on the last few questions so we can get get through here. Um, so I just wanna there was a question and answer uh, provided here in the chat, but one was if we were to try to get uh, senators, particularly from states, right, to kind of up that Senate count which senators might be most likely to be persuaded. And Barbara, Barbara Helmick from DC Vote suggested Rhode Island, Michigan, Cantwell in Washington, Cinema in Arizona, and Nevada. So if you're in any of those places, perhaps those are some folks that just need a little more pushing to, to um, get on our, our side on this. Um, Eleanor Hart, who's one of our, our members here in DC, reminded us that pretty much every issue that's important to the league, and she lists many of them, um, right? Uh, basically, we, we believe this, the citizens of DC would kind of help push those things forward by adding extra voice in favor of those items, um, such as gun safety, climate change, healthcare, um, women's right to choose uh, through Congress. This is a theory, but also another theory is if DC had was a state and had a different representation system, both internally and externally, we might perhaps see a different makeup within the within the state, the new state than the current district. We don't know because we've never been a state, so we don't know what interest there might be in other parties coming in and having and really trying to convert members of our of our community. So. Um, so just that's a good good thing to think about. Um, see, uh, Sandy Spence is mentioning a long time ago there is suggestion that Congress add DC and Puerto Rico simultaneously, assuming that basically there'd be a balance. So DC would add two Democrat senators. The assumption went. And Puerto Rico would add to Republican senators. And has this been something that's been considered or talked about recently? Yeah, I let me just quickly answer that. Um, we certainly, we we being people in D.C. are talking to Puerto Rico people. Um, the difficulty is that Puerto Rico hasn't really decided yet that they want to be a state, um, even though there was a. Um, referendum a couple of years ago um, and it looked like oh yeah they overwhelmingly voted for statehood in fact two-thirds of the of the people who of the voters boycotted that election because they didn't even agree about the way that the questions were asked so I think there's still I mean if you think about DC about 20 years ago when we were still trying to figure out how best to do this you might think that's where Puerto Rico is right now in their own fashion, so. Right, and as it doesn't quite seem fair to tie our, our self-determination to their progress on their self-determination, right? So, I mean, that would be, even though we know it might keep the balance of power. Um, let's see, Barbara provided some similar, similar information that we wanna support them in what they wanna do, just like we'd like them to support us in what we wanna do, right? Um, and then, you know, I think, and then Teresa Rankin mentions that um, she's really excited and if the League and other allies could use our networks to really reach out. And I think, um, I know this has been Anne's strategy 
uh, is really using the power of the fact that League is located everywhere, right? We're in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We are, um, we have, we have the opportunity, right, to use a network. And this is why we're, we're excited. We have this potential to be the grassroots effort um, and uh, Kathy mentioned earlier all of our events that we did as part of um, uh, around the Days of Action and every, all, all 50 state leagues and the District of Columbia, right, signed on to the People Powered Fair Max campaign, which is about redistricting, you know, fundamentally and fair representation. And DC's main call is to get on the map, right? We don't have a map, <laughs> really. We have the map we showed you earlier. We want that to be our map, and we want to be on the map in Congress so that um, people can really hear our voice. So um, that's that's our contribution to to the the People Powered Fair Maps campaign. And I'm sorry, Anne, if that was going to be one of your closing comments. I just got really excited. <laughs> I'm totally delighted for you to say that, and I am totally delighted to have been talking with all of you all. Glad to see people that I haven't seen for a while. Yay. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for joining. And please feel free to send us um, any kind of emails for uh, follow-up questions, et cetera. And, and Jess will send an email with all of our, our various links. And we're happy to you know, do a Zoom call for your local leagues or your state leagues. Um, I'm volunteering Anne to, to do this as often as she's willing and able. Uh, and we have a team of people working on, on uh, full rights for DC. So, you know, it would be rare for us not to be able to do something if, if you'd like a program or an event or something um, to keep everybody busy while we're all sort of sheltered at home. But, um, We'd be happy to do that. So thank you all for, for letting us do this test run. <laughs> um, we'll be providing uh, a, an email address to get in touch with Anne, who is our point of contact for all uh, of our statehood activities. And you know, I just want to thank again Josh, Josh Birch and Barbara Helmick, who came and represented just some of our coalition partners in this effort, right? We are one of many who are organizations who are trying to kind of bring us bring us all equal votes so thank you all so much uh good night and good luck and good health to you all um in this in this trying time thank you thank you